Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's study. As we look to conclude our study in Zechariah 7, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance so that we might more clearly understand the words of this prophet and how they apply to us today? Shall we now ask for his blessing in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we ask today for the guidance of your spirit. As we look to open your word and the words of your prophets, we see even more our great need of you. Each day has been blessed in all that you would have done. We pray now, Father, for your guidance. Direct us so that that which is done may be according to your will so that our will and our actions may more properly reflect your character. We thank you, Father, for the influence of the Spirit. We thank you for the Spirit's convicting us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We need you now so that our minds may be opened. We thank you for sending the Comforter, and we ask that we may be willing and ready vessels for that which the Comforter will do. Direct us now. Be with us in all things. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As we look to complete what we have been studying in the book of Zechariah, we have quite a bit right now to be covered. But some of this we're going to have to deal with is going to be review. So turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 7. We're going to start on verse 8. Now, why would we be looking at Zechariah 7, verse 8? If we were to look at the original section headings that the translator, translators had used, Zechariah 7 shows us at the beginning that the Jews are sent to inquire concerning the set fasts. Then Zechariah reproves the hypocrisy of their fasts. <clears throat> and beginning with verse 8, the Jews are exhorted by repentance to remove the cause of their calamity. Is this not the situation we find ourselves in now after July 18th? Are we not being told that we need to repent to remove the cause of our calamity? We are shown that we need unity, and yet we are fragmented. We are shown that we need to have love for our other brothers and sisters. As we talked last week, we have offered many times for others to come and to join us, yet many times they refuse. So we begin here. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. As we discussed, they made their hearts as a diamond lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets, where therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. Are we guilty today of laying the pleasant land, the spiritual pleasant land desolate? Are we finding ourselves scattered today? Are we choosing not to hear. Now, Mrs. White is very direct. 
as we are going to finish this portion of Zechariah, we turn to Manuscript 64, 1902, which was unpublished. The first paragraph is quite telling. I dare not leave Nashville without presenting this message to those who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants. Men have had it in their power greatly to help the work in the South by being men of principle, honest with their brethren and with God. What a different showing there would be today in the Southern field had they fulfilled God's purpose for them. The neglect of this field stands as a witness against them. Does this say anything to us today? Okay, Dwight. Yes. So just uh, a little note, whether it's significant or not, I don't know. But um, so we, I looked at that verse, mm-hmm. uh, Zechariah 7, verse 8, and it's the verse number 22971. That's 22nd the 22,971st verse of the Bible. So right. I looked at your birthday and counted 22,971 days. And that goes to June 22nd, 2022. That's interesting. And, but it's also the 11th day of the third month on the biblical calendar, which if doubled is June 22nd, Right. So 622, half of that is 311, which comes from Samuel Snow's letters when his Pentecost letter, his June 22nd letter is published on the 11th day of the third month. So it's written on the 6th of the third. Anyway, now the the presentation that I do is I I do the presentation and understanding the lines on that date. And uh, the topic is Parminder. So anyway, I just thought I'd, you know that you think about that. I I find it intriguing whenever we have a symbol that brings us to a June 22nd. Yeah. Now, you know, and I chose just your birthday because you're doing the presentation right now. You know, if I chose somebody else's birthday, we'd have a different date or if I use some other date. But anyway, that's... uh, The reason that I find it interesting June 22nd is the birth date of a a friend of mine who, in his family, they they have studied the charts for well over 60 years. Oh, yeah. But even more so, June 22nd was the birth date of my grandmother, my mother's mother. Then my mother's birthday. My apology. Then... February 11th was the birthday of my mother. Stephen's birthday. And Stephen's birthday as well. I'm intrigued that I have three generations of my family, including myself, that have birth dates that have something to do with biblical or Millerite history. Mm -hmm. But this particular manuscript written in 1902, where she is stating, I dare not leave Nashville without presenting this message to those who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants. Destruction is a strange work to God. We have those that have engaged in a strange work of hindering the Lord's servants. And this is being tied to the Nashville message. Now, just as we've just finished reading, she proceeds to repeat Zechariah 7, 8 to 14. Now, here she then quotes, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. And he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. And I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. 
Do you recall our study on Zechariah 5? Wasn't this flying role, the given dimensions for that role, weren't they the porch, Solomon's porch of the temple? Or am I, am I wrong? Well, I know they add up to two 1260s in inches, but I don't remember about Solomon's porch. Okay. It it doesn't, uh, um, because the measurements in Zechariah 5, um, okay, 20 cubits, 10 cubits. uh, hmm. So in uh, 1 Kings, uh, 6 verse 3, the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits was the length thereof according to the breadth of the house, and 10 cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. Yeah, so the 20 and the 10 is in the porch of Solomon. Yeah, so I'd forgot about that detail. So if we were, if we multiplied the two, we would have 300 cubits, right? What, if you're multiplying 20 by 10? Yeah, excuse me, 200 cubits. 200, yeah. Huh? Yeah, you'd have 200 square cubits. Okay. But but what we had done is we had taken uh, um, we had taken the all of the sides round about, like the circumference, or not the circumference, the perimeter, the perimeter of the 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 flying scroll. Right. Right. So you got. Uh, ends up being 630 inches times two, right? Well, it's 420 plus 210. Yeah, that together, you get 630 inches. And then, it, so the whole perimeter is 1260 inches. Right. right. Of course, two sides of it, so to speak, right? So together, that's 2520. Is, that's the measurement that I've understood. And that's using, using 21 inches to the cubit. So... If we are unwilling to follow the admonition given in Zechariah 7, verses 8 to 14, and we are then experiencing this curse, are we then not accepting the judgment of the seven times? Well, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to this, this, I mean, we dealt with some of this in Zechariah 5, but it, but it's relating to Zechariah 7 as well. So we can put these together. Right. That is the people in the movement who have rejected the symbolic use of numbers, July, rejected July 18th. They've done so not just as an intellectual exercise regarding, you know, understanding it. It really has been an, a, an accusation against their brother, brethren. Right. Correct. So that is, they imagine evil against his brother in their heart. That part of Zechariah 7 verse, uh, whatever that is, 9 or 10. Right. That That's really been the problem. It hasn't been so much just an intellectual understanding of things. It's been how, how we have dealt with one another in these disagreements. That's really been the issue. Now, the now next in Zechariah 10, um, that, that one, that's the verse where we have, uh, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. It's interesting. We're to oppress not the widow. Now, the widow is the Hebrew number 490. Amazing. Long's number. And yeah. the fatherless is 3490. The stranger is 1616. A doubling. Yeah. And, and a doubling to 16 represents the two periods of eight days dealing with uh, uh, the cleansing of the temple. Right. Um, now, the poor is 6041. I have no idea what that would be. But but uh, anyway, we have some symbols there that we can relate to uh, this message. Well, they, the widow being Hebrew 490. Yeah. Given the periods of 490 that we are shown in Scripture, whether we're dealing with the 490 for the kingship, the 490 for the temple, the 490 for the Jews, they're all periods of judgment, right? Yeah. So there's a lot there. 
But of course, mm -hmm. there's many that would say that this is just because it's chance. Yeah, well, I, well, I don't think it's chance here in this case, but. Uh... So as she had presented also manuscript four from 1902, she repeats again, Zechariah seven verses four to seven. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye have fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even those seventy years, did you fat did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her? When men inhabited the south and the plain. Now, you pointed out directly that there are specific feasts. Here, here we only have mentioned the, the feasts of the fifth and the seventh month. The fast. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the the dis, the destruction of the temple in the fifth month and the death of Gedaliah in the seventh month. And usually that, that's the way it's understood that those those are the fasts. But we know there's a fast of the fourth month and a fast of the tenth month, and they relate to the siege of Jerusalem and the other one to the breaking down of the walls of Jerusalem. But here it just mentions these two because that's seventy years, right? That they're talking about. Now, it's not 70 years at this point, right? It's only 68 years. Okay. So here, here we have, as you are pointing out, the 4th, the 5th, the 7th, and the 10th. Yeah. Those are the months in which there are fasts. Yeah, the commemorative fasts regarding the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So, and... and, and uh, but the 70 years only refers to the fast of the fifth month and the fast of the seventh month, because those both happen in 586. Okay. So this word is coming onto the people. This word is coming even to the priests. It's coming to two classes, right? Yeah. Does this have any application for us today? And how should we see this? Now, Mrs. White continued, these words outline the experience of the people of God for the last 20 years. These words outline the experience of the people of God from 1882 to 1902. When you place it in a context such as this, when we look at the rebellion of 1888, when we look at how Uriah Smith tore down the testimony of Mrs. White. How G.I. Butler chose to state that portions of scripture were not inspired. And we come down in this to the 1901 General Conference session. And what did Mrs. White say about the 1901 General Conference session? The worst general conference the session that she had been to? Was that the one? Yes. Okay. Sure it was 1901? I believe so. Okay. I know that's the one where she called for reorganization. Right. It's the one um, where everybody's patting themselves on the back about how good, you know, the church is prospering and so forth. And then she gets up and just tears into them. And lays it straight on the line. Yeah. These words, this in Zechariah, outline the experience of the people of God for this time period. God has a controversy with them. They have followed perverted principles. He cannot give them his blessing. The managers in our institutions are not converted daily. They do not live the law of God. In spirit and in letter, they have violated the law. Unseen witnesses behold many transactions that the actors would not like their fellow men to see. 
by bringing in worldly, selfish methods. Satan has cast his dark shadow over God's work. How ashamed would be those who have yielded to his temptations could they see their actions as God sees them. In this situation, do we see an application of this warning, of this admonition for us today? Or do we wish to let this just remain in the past? Manuscript 122, 1906. Again, she chooses to repeat Zechariah 7, 8 to 14. The theme here is that she is telling us of our condition now. The Lord would have his people Christ-like in all their dealings with one another. Read the last chapter of Malachi. No one is to be retained in such an important place as the publishing house who does not evidence a kindly spirit, reveal a high sense of the work committed to him, and let his light shine forth. Now we go to letter 354 of 1906. Men and women are to be taught how to prepare food for the common people. This branch of education is to be given a place in every school established. The students are to be patiently taught how to cook, as well as how to read. The very best methods are to be employed in teaching the industries essential to everyday life. Instruction is to be given faithfully in simple methods of treating the sick. I found it very interesting in conversations I've had this last week. One church in this area is seen as being extremely difficult because they have chosen to follow what Mrs. White laid out regarding that our tables should not have cheese, that we need a simpler, more healthy diet. And yet so many are being critical of all that is going in and on at this one church. The attitude of others is give the people what they want. Is that how we can properly represent the gospel? The Lord has given to us as a people great knowledge upon health reform. The work is to go forward. But God forbid that the food business should continue to take so large a place as it has taken. The capabilities and talents of valuable workers are not to be confined to the production of foods while spiritual interests become secondary. This is a matter that must be dealt with upon a right basis, else it will become a great hindrance to us in our work of soul saving. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me. And when ye did eat and when ye did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities therefore round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. Now, here again, Mrs. White quotes Zechariah 7, 4 to 14. The judgments of the Lord will surely come upon our cities. Since the San Francisco earthquake, much wickedness has been seen in Oakland. Murder and violence and crime are breaking out on every side. We are now to give the last message of warning to Oakland. Brother and Sister Haskell are laboring there. Elder W.W. W. Simpson from Los Angeles is now in Oakland and will soon begin his labors. He has been very successful in his work in Los Angeles. And he will now labor for a time in Oakland. How devastating was the San Francisco earthquake? How devastating is the damage soon to come upon 
the major cities of this country. How will the damage come upon Chicago? Is anyone aware here? Well, I know there was a great, great fire there, but I forget uh, what year that was. Right. What What is the nickname for Chicago? Does anybody know? Windy City. And the damage and destruction will come upon Chicago with great wind. Now, that's not according to me. That's according to Sister White. Again, she repeats in Manuscript 8 of 1914, Zechariah 7, 8 to 14. The Lord speaks the truth plainly that we may understand our true condition and that we may overcome the objectionable features of our character. So if the Lord is speaking plainly, if he is revealing to us our condition and there are objectionable features of our character, have we then passed through the fire that is to remove the dross from us? Come into line. Repent. Repent ye and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19. Confess your sins with deep sorrow of heart. Leave the ways and the works of Satan. And come to Christ with humility and repentance with heartbroken and a contrite spirit. Exchange your life of wickedness for a life of righteousness. Trust in the mercy of him who gave his life, that you might be saved, not in your sins, but by repentance and faith and confession from your sins. How many steps? Repentance, faith, conviction, and confession. Is this not an example of, of the message of the first, second, and third angel's message? Do we not fear God when we repent of our sins? Do we not give glory to him when we begin to exercise faith? And are we not willing to confess when we recognize that the hour of his judgment has come? By your example, show to others what true repentance means and what conversion will do for a man. Let others see in you the power that comes from an active faith. Show the world how to become partakers of that glorious hope, which cannot be taken away. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Turn ye, turn ye, he says. For why will you die? Our past life with its mistakes is not a pleasant picture to look upon. But it must be held up to our view that we may desire something better. Now, brothers and sisters, our past lives are not a pretty representation. Here I speak for myself. I, I, I will speak for none other. I know the sins that I allowed in my past. For all that is written in the word, I am guilty. I know that I stand as a party that has broken the commandments. The adversary would have me despair about this because it's not pleasant. How many of us want to have our past presented before us day by day, but it must be held up to our view that we may desire something better. Do we all want something better or do we want what we've had in the past? These are the questions that we've had to ask as we have been going through this in this chapter. What else do we have today? What else have we seen as we've gone through Zechariah 7? Does this have impact and import for us now? Is this something that has struck home? What do we have here? Is Zechariah 7 written for us? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And if it is written for us, then what are we to do? Well, he, he gets admonition. How can we do that? Well... One is accept the message of July 18th. So just I was looking at these other uh, 
words. So we had in Zechariah 7, verse 10, right? We had looked at uh, the widow, 490. Right. The fatherless, 3490. So that just relates to the three periods of 490 years that we found, right? Then we have that 1616, a doubling, which relates to second angel's message in regard to the the cleansing of the temple for 16 days. And then the word poor, which is 6041. Um, if you count from September 11th, uh, 6,041 days, you come to March 27th. You know, if, if you start from um, 2001, you come to March 27th, 2018. But uh, so it connects September 11th and the symbol for the Levites. So I was trying to look, figure out these other ones as well. But uh, it's also Zechariah 7.10. So that's a symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month, which is the 187th day of the year. Right. So so there's a lot of symbols there that, I mean, somebody looking on may think it's kind of weird what we do. But, I mean, we already understand that it applies to us. So, So we're not really doing anything that strange by by looking at it that way because we already know this but it's just a confirmation of that we have a choice to make we have eternity to gain should we choose to repent i found it interesting this week that there were many that were giving presentations that some would find objectionable one such presentation, if I heard it correctly, was that those that choose to believe that it's going to be okay to sin and continue sinning until Christ comes. And then Christ is going to make everything just all of a sudden change so we won't sin anymore. That these people are ignoring the message of the third angel. Another one from an independent ministry gave a presentation that said those that continue to eat meat will not be saved. And I know some that got very frustrated with that, that presentation, even though they really greatly liked the speaker. How are we to approach things when we hear a message that strikes at the heart of something that we have held on to in our lives. They start off praying about it. Praying about that is the first thing to do. Right. I have many friends of mine that believe that salvation can only be found within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm sure that some would consider me a heretic by stating that salvation is through Christ alone. These are Adventists, right? These are Adventists, is correct. We have to decide under whose banner we wish to stand. We must decide who we serve. In all of these situations, when we are presented with things that are to be given up, are we willing to accept this or are we willing to reject this? Where comes conviction of sin? Who is responsible to convict us of sin? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts and comforts. Correct. If we are unwilling to be convicted of sin, then what are we doing? Or you blast me against the Holy Spirit. We're rejecting the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Is it safe for us to reject the Holy Spirit? That's the worst thing a person could do. Christ found a very difficult point that he had to present. He said before all of his disciples, all of them that followed him, all of them that had seen great miracles, you must eat my flesh 
and drink my blood. And we find this in the book of John. And many walked no more with him from that day forward, saying, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? It would not surprise me to be told that those that walked no more from that day with Christ were among the throng, agitated by the priests, saying, we have no king except Caesar. Bless you, Theodore. So, we have choices to make today. And these choices are going to be very, very personal. God is willing to save. The question that I must ask you each, are you willing to be saved? This is my question and my thought for you this Sabbath. Now, this next week, we are going to engage in Zechariah 8. Are there any other questions or comments on what we have covered here today? One thing I found in my life when I'm struggling over giving up a certain habit, a certain sin, is to ask God to give me a hatred of that habit and sin and a relish for what he wants to present as a substitute. Okay. I found it interesting in conversations. Um, someone that I know has had issues with diet. And there are many that are regarded as friends that continue to tell them that all you have to do is replace what you're struggling with with something else. Now, in this case, they gave a recommendation to replace the item with which they were struggling with Loma Linda and Worthington food products. Only Bolivian Wendy Ham. <laughs> okay. The problem was that because these products are made primarily from wheat and they are very gluten intolerant, they became more ill in this situation. In this case, the cure that was offered was worse than the illness. Well, with sodium and, and uh, fats and chemicals. Agreed. I remember walking, sorry, but I remember walking into the ABC uh, semi thing trailer one, one year, I think it was 2013, and I, I said, why are you selling products? Uh, and I started naming off the brands, right, Worthington, Loma, and et cetera. I said, they're, they're owned by Monsanto. And the people were, I said, you need to do your research and quit selling this garbage, basically. I, I quit buying that stuff like years, like probably back in the nineties. Well, I had a point in this, in this particular conference a few years ago. The ABC had a major fire and they had to find a place to reestablish while they rebuilt their ABC. I walked into the place that was the reestablished location. And I was very shocked because when, when my family came into the church and began to study in the church in 1968, there were a lot of changes in diet that we were being asked to make. One of the biggest had to do with seafood. One of the situations that I found that the ABC was offering was vegetarian shrimp, vegetarian crab, many things that I've always came to understand were unclean. Yet now that we're doing this with vegetarian ingredients, this is okay to eat. The fact that they're owned by Monsanto, they don't want to bring it up. The fact that this is a combination of chemicals, they don't want to bring it up. The fact that it's a lot of protein, way more protein than what it's supposed to replicate, 
they don't want to bring up either. None of that is according to God's order. Mrs. White was very clear in these documents that there's too much attention made on the food business. Yet, are we willing to listen corporately or individually to what's being said? What it reminds me of is uh, it's okay to have paganism in the church and wokeism in the church as long as we call it Christian. It's okay to have rock so-called music in the church as long as, you know, it's Christian, it's contemporary Christian music. <sighs> Don't even get me started. Well, to finish what we're saying here, when we are accepting woke, LGBTQ, alternative lifestyles, are we not choosing to accept adultery and other sins that we're told are not to occur within the church? I remember sitting in on uh, a meeting one time and this... Uh, young fellow was complaining because elders had rebuked him for living with his girlfriend and they both had lied about it and he was comp sitting at this table complaining but i i was appalled like i didn't say anything but i just glared at him and i was tempted to more than glare at him but i thought what in the world this is so corrupt and shortly after that i just quit attending that church just <sighs> Too much for me to bear. I want to thank you, each one, for your input today. I want to thank you for your attention on what we have addressed. Shall we now close this session with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for sending the Spirit. We thank you for the conviction of sin that the Spirit brings. Yes, we look forward to being comforted, but we wish to draw closer to you. Please be with us now. Direct us in the meeting that is to follow. We pray for Brother Theodore for this message and that we may directly repent and be converted so that we may more truly walk with you. We thank you for the hours of the Sabbath and the blessing that they bring. Direct us now. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.